Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. Well, everybody knows how much I appreciate authors, and we have them on uh, frequently on our show. And our book of the month for August was great because we featured our book of the month was Confessions of a Survivor. And Kathleen Barbie is the author. And yes, the front of the cover says riveting, funny, real. Well, it was was funny in a way, but it was real. So thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Kathleen. And you've had so much happen in your life. It's uh it's like if you look back and it's a good thing that you journaled or you would not have believed it, would you? Definitely. Sometimes when I reread it, every now and then I'll pick it up and reread it. And it's like I'm reading about somebody else's <laughs> life, but I still get something out of it looking back. And as you, well, let's just, why don't you tell the story a little bit about what happened to you, you know, how old you were, if you don't mind, and, and, and who you were living with and what kind of help you had and what, let's start okay. off with what happened to you. All right. Well, I was 59 and I was living at home, divorced with my 18-year-old daughter, and Marissa, who's in, in the book quite a bit. And I was teaching at the college and teaching aesthetics, which is facial spa treatments and that type of thing. And I was going in for a regular physical, and I had all my blood work. And the night before I was going in for my results, I just happened to be sitting in front of a decorating show and massaging my face and saying, oh, should I give myself a facial tonight? What do I need a treatment? And I found a lump. And it was right here on the left side of my neck, and it was a hard mass, and it felt like a walnut. So the next day, when I went in to get my results of my physical, which were the usual results, you could lose a few pounds, you could, you know, just take a little better care of yourself, and this and that. And I said, well, what about this, uh, Dr. Del Negro? Oh, he never, it was a man? was a woman a woman she She was an old army doctor so she never really got to that and then when she touched it she said oh my dear she said honey i'm gonna pray for you because after 40 if it's a hard mass most of the time it is malignancy so and did you go you had your physical wait wait you had your physical and you were alone I was so, alone. So all of a sudden this shot you in the head about, oh, my God. Right. I'm listening like, you know, watch your sugar, lose a few pounds, take better care of yourself, drink more water. And then I said, okay, okay, the usual. And then I said, but what about this? And then the whole mood changed. And when I left, she said, I'll pray for you. So she referred me to an ENT, Dr. Galen, who's wonderful. And um, I went in and had my biopsies. And they wanted to get me in the hospital immediately to find out where the primary was. Where is the, where is the cancer coming from? Oh, I see. So, because I don't know very much about this. So. Okay. Well, this is head and neck cancer. And my primary tumor was on the very base of my tongue, way in the back of my mouth, similar to Michael Douglas's diagnosis. And I went into Wellington Hospital and... They did the biopsy, and they said they couldn't remove it. And the only thing that they could do to totally eradicate the cancer for sure would be to, and it had spread a little bit in those lymph nodes that were swollen. So I could, uh, the, my oncologist, Dr. Feinstein, said we could remove your voice box and amputate your tongue, and then you'll be totally cancer-free. And I said, well... I'm kind of used to speaking and eating, and of course I taught, and I have grandchildren and full life. And I said, what's my other option? And he said, maximum chemo and radiation at the same time, and we'll give it a shot, but it has to start immediately. Well, I would have done that. I think that was a very smart idea. Yeah, I kind of get used to having the, I the would tongue think and so. the voice part. I would think so. <laughs> but by the grace of God, it worked. So how long, but that's part of your book. That's part of my book, the whole treatment. From the day I was diagnosed till, I mean, I journaled before and after, of course, but I took that section and I happened to meet an editor at a Christmas party uh, a year after the whole experience. And she said, I heard about your treatment and I heard about your life and I heard you adopted a daughter, I adopted a little girl since 
I'd be gone into remission. Well, she was 10. Now she's 15. But so she said, have you ever thought of writing a story? I said, well, it's already written. I kept a journal. So it's very personal to turn your innermost thoughts into a journal and have people read it, your, especially your children, your friends. And as you know, you read it. You, you see, I didn't hold back because I never thought anybody would be sharing it. But the reason it's so good is because there are other people who have the same problem. And exactly. whether it was where in that particular location or someplace else, I mean, there are people that think they have to have all their their bowel removed, and and then what are they going to have a bag? I mean, it's always there's something. There's always another way. There's but, always an option, and there's always hope. But I think that I admired you so much because of what you did do. Be able, you know, confessions. You Thank see you. confessions, <laughs> and you say, "Oh, well, what's she confessing <laughs> to?" Right? Well, that wasn't the original title. The original title I thought of the day I went into the ENT and got the results of my biopsy, and he said, it's really a fast-moving cancer. we got to get you right in. I was on my lunch hour. They had called me in to St. Mary's and said, I'm teaching. I said, but I have an hour. I can drive down. And and he said to me, it's very fast-moving, and have you eaten today already? I'd like to put you right in the hospital. And I was in shock, of course. And I said... "Um, I need at least a day to get a substitute, tell my children, just gather my thoughts. And um, then I, I left the, at the studio, and he gave me the day. He said he'd meet me at Wellington Hospital the next morning, 7 a.m., for the um, biopsies. And I went, um, I went to the, I went north instead of south, so I know it was of in shock. Of course. And I'm driving, and all of a sudden, of I smelt the dump, and I said, like, <laughs> what the heck? I'm already late coming back from lunch. <laughs> now I have to compose myself for this class of yeah, students. Right. That chance. Yeah, and it was only the third day into a new class. So what I did is I came in, and my boss and my coworkers looked at me like, is everything okay? No. And I said, <gasps> I will talk to you at 3 o'clock. Let's have a meeting and uh, get the department head, because I'm going to be needing a substitute. And I tried to do the you know, blank face and poker face and do what I had to do. And that was it. I called my married daughter, Gina, my oldest daughter, who has since become widowed, which is another part of the, the story after the after the book. But my son-in-law was a pastor, and he was there for me in the hospital, praying for me before I went into surgery. And they had the whole way, and um, we've lost him from diabetes unexpectedly leaving my daughter widowed with three children. So that's how I ended up spending a lot more time with my ex-husband between my cancer therapy and everything I went through and then having such a loss in the family. And now David and I have remarried. And and you see, so we don't know where we're going ever. What Never. happened to you, you didn't know... But you were saying, so what was the original book, name of the book? Confessions oh, I'm so of, sorry. No, it's good. What, what was it? Um, so the doctor came in and said, I, I'm sorry to tell you, it's very fast moving. We'd get you in the hospital, and it's, it's very serious, and it has started to spread. And his assistant, young girl, looked down at my shoes, and she said, but you have beautiful shoes on. So my first title was going to be, <laughs> <laughs> you have head and neck cancer dot 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 but i love your shoes <laughs> and uh, that's very funny <laughs> but my editor's course, husband no. read it yeah. and he said it's more like confessions of a survivor because i talk about such personal things yes you do and and it it was admirable that you did it but of course you were in a way never even knowing if it was going to work exactly which exactly. i thought was must be hard. Every day you wake up and you say, oh, I'm here today, right? You say, I'm here, and the first day that you wake up and the pain is gone in recovery is a wonderful thing. You say, I, I don't feel pain this morning. But you were sick a lot. Oh, I mean, it, it was, so it was that's grueling. The other it was thing grueling. About it was, being so sick. Exactly. It was and, a... Yeah, because uh-huh. they had to give you all the power. It sounded like they had to give you full force. Exactly. Of the chemo for them to really be able to get to it. And, it, you know, that was hard. Yeah, it knocked me for a loop and it caused a lot of turmoil in the family, which, of course, I talk about in the book. Yeah. With all the, the different personalities of the children coming home and everybody dealing with it in their own way. It's funny, just before <clears throat> I had another interview and we were talking about uh, what happens when older adults need care 
and they have someone here locally caring for him, someone caring from a from away, and they're all conflicting about everything. Exactly. And so it sounds like you know that's that's really the same thing. But of course, they see it as love. True. You know that that's what they want to to be able to do for you. They want you to survive. And so let's just uh, look at this a minute. Um, when you were going through all this, did you? Talk to other people going through it also, because I don't remember reading that. I talked to one person. I had a dear friend, Heidi, that I used to teach with, and she told me her her neighbor had survived, had neck cancer, and he was an eight-year survivor. That helped. Yes. Well, it helped initially because a nice gentleman, he called me, and we chatted, and it was very nice. He gave me his number and said, if you ever need to talk to me during treatment, and he had counted how many days he was in treatment, how many hospitalizations, everything. Well, one day I was feeling ex- exceptionally low, like, I don't know if I can endure this mm-hmm. anymore. I mean, you get to that point, like, do I have it in me? And I called him. And then he really gave me the <laughs> rundown. I would soon be drinking glasses of uh, broken, broken, uh, broken glass and razor blades and... But you could, would, la- but you know. Well, that's I'm laughing now, funny, but I course. wasn't then. No, at the time. But I mean, when I hear it right, if yeah. you want to laugh, but the time was, yeah. Can I make this? Right? And I and I would have found out on my own, but um, he gave me a little warning. I think he said 118 days he spent in the hospital altogether, and then he told me, um, you know, you you may never get any taste back, you may never get a sense of smell back, you may always be different. A lot of times when I'm stressed, I lose my voice. This is always going to be my vulnerable area. But I can eat again. The stomach tube is out. and uh, Oh, the stomach tube, right. Oh, that, that, was, was a, that was a nightmare. Thing. That was right. Can you imagine? But it that? kept me alive. Yes. And I put it off as long yeah. as I could. Because you can't really eat when you're so sick, can you? That's no, the problem. especially when this is the area. Yeah, that's right, because that's where it goes. Exactly. I couldn't even swallow water at one point, and I would have to pour it into the tube. To keep my hydration up. Oh yeah, this was uh, it was quite an interesting uh, <laughs> confession, I must say. So, so now uh, tell me though. So how long exactly? I don't remember now. How long exactly from the time that you had the you know the first treatment until it was over? How many years was that? Or was it? Well, it's a couple. I've, of, I've gone through the ten. I've gone through the five years. But wh- Since my diagnosis, it was almost 2010 when I got diagnosed. It was uh, okay, ten- the fall of um, 2009. I got diagnosed. I had several months of treatment. And then I had to go through the first two years with no reoccurrence for them to say I went through the window. And then the five years I hit. So I just went through the door. So I'm really looking forward to hitting year six and hopefully... More beyond that. Right, but the actual treatments that were so horrendous, how long did that go? I believe the treatments were six to nine months. Yeah, so it was and about a year. what I did, mm. yeah, I was under a year, but I made that a watch out, and I had all my treatment dates on a poster board, and I made it like a watch out, <laughs> like I was, like Stratego, like I was going into battle, because that's what <laughs> you, you do is you go that's into battle. very good. And I had hills and valleys and right. woods and rivers to cross. And, and every time I got through a treatment and got through a radiation, I highlighted it. And then, of course, I had my setbacks. But I could see light at the end of the tunnel. I could see hope. And, of course, my faith. Without my faith, I wouldn't have gotten through. Were you as beautiful before you had cancer as you are now? Oh, my gosh. Thank you. But... um you let's, look very good. So, thank you. So well, I taught skin care, but let's just say you, you do show the effects. I'm not. But see, that, but I, I don't know you other than seeing you now. Well, I'm just grateful to have hair and be able to throw a little makeup on and look okay because I know what it's like to go out there in public when you can't even stand up. You have to hold on to the grocery cart, and I was skin and bones, and then losing the hair and not feeling attractive was a shock to me and I feel like I took a lot for granted all my life being able to close shop and feel pretty and and all of that so what did this teach you well first of all without my faith I don't think I would have made it because you have to have that belief system like this is for a reason like that God was giving me this as a lesson as a assignment 
a challenge and that eventually at the end of the road, if I could make it through it, that there would be uh, an explanation, a reward or a reason. And I do believe that was um, adopting my daughter, Destiny. Yeah, which... that's something that's really very <laughs> interesting, too, because you went through this, and I don't know too much of that story. Well, I, I talked about it a little bit in the book. Yeah, I saw I, Destiny uh, in there. but I was a, a size 2, and they said the stomach tube wouldn't come out until I could reach 120, 125 pounds, which was a real struggle. And so I, I went to a personal trainer. I started working out to build muscle. I went on a high-calorie diet because at first food had, of course, no taste, and I went from bland and soups to eventually eating. And I, I lost some teeth with the radiation that happens. And um, so I was feeling pretty um, down and out, and um, I was invited to a St. Patrick's Day party at... Um, you know, somewhere on the waterfront. Anyway, one of those parties where the, everybody drinks and has corned beef and has fun. And I felt like, wow, I'm out among the living. And yeah. it was my first experience. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and it was wonderful until the next morning. And then the next morning, of course, my body at, at a size two couldn't tolerate any alcohol. Uh. And uh, I had to go in and teach and I had a headache. And I said, God, surely you did not spare me to abuse my body this way. Yeah. So I said, reveal to me, you know, what do I need to do now? Because I felt at the time, that was before my daughter lost her husband, that the grandchildren were, were you know, getting along pretty, pretty well with their parents and the kids were growing up and my baby was 18. So as soon as I said, reveal to me, I walked on to campus and a student I knew only slightly came over to me and said, Miss Barbie, I hear You love children, you have a big family, you've adopted a couple of children. And at that point, I had six, four that I had, two that I had adopted with David. And she said, we have a little girl, she's been with us a year, and uh, we have five children under the age of five. Two are in diapers, they're one-year-olds. And the mom has a drug problem, the dad's in jail. And the mother never came back. And social services lost track of her. And she said, I really feel like uh, she needs a mentor. So would you mentor this little girl? So I felt like, this is my answer. I just prayed. And so I said, give me the address. I'll take her off ice cream Saturday. And um, I'd love to. So my kids, of course, thought I was nuts. First thing the 18-year-old said was, Mom, you're old. You're sick. Why do you <laughs> Why do you want to do this to yourself? Terrible. You're raised enough kids. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, I went to pick her up in Delray and prayed the whole way. And when she came out of the house, not only was she physically beautiful, she sat beside me. We checked each other out. And I said, would you like to get to know me better? Then maybe we could go have dinner or something. And she said, I don't have a shy bone in my body. She said, let me change my clothes. Let's go to dinner tonight. And how old was she? She was 10. And now she's 15. She was said, she says, I don't have a shy, shy bone in my body. Right. But my intentions were just to mentor her. Yes. And I started picking her up every weekend and then school vacations. And all of a sudden, in June, I got a call from social services. They finally tracked her down and realized that the home she was in had not been approved and that the people were a little overwhelmed. And basically, she was doing a lot of diaper changing and a, a lot of things that she... You know, it was a little too much for her. And they said, how would you feel about adopting her? And I said, I I just turned 60. I just went through stage four cancer. I've raised six children, two adopted. I don't know if I have it in me, but I, I love her. And um, I said, what happens if I say no? And they said, in Palm Beach County, there are hundreds of children waiting for homes. Hundreds of children waiting for foster homes or adoptive parents. And they said she will go back to the state shelter, which is a local orphanage. And she's already told me her horror stories of being in and out of different institutions in um, the area. So I could never do that to her. So I said, how much time do I have? They said, you have three days to get (laughs) fingerprinted, background check, home visit psychological workup 
you know, they come in, look in the cupboards, do everything. Uh, and then they said on her last day of school, just pick her up. And she had a rubbish bag with some old, dirty clothes in it. And uh, she said, please don't talk much about me today. But anyway, I can't help it. Because so it was a dream for her. It was a dream for her. Little dreams did she know this is what was going to happen. Exactly. I have her in private Christian school. She's a straight-A student. She has a voice like an angel. She was invited to sing the national anthem at uh, Malago for Trump a couple of years ago. And I had the honor of going to that beautiful event, $5,000 a plate on them. <laughs> I mean, it's like this this kid that fell between the cracks that was lost in the system and we we really saved each other. And her name is Destiny. Yes. And, which and is asked, interesting yes. how that name even came. And then since I've remarried my ex in December, David, and now she says to me, I have a mom and a pops. This so, is so amazing. I, I mean, I want, I, you know, your book, Confessions of a Survivor, is at first, you know, was a little sad to read about. And then I said, no, this is great. She has a lot of spirit. And I think this would be a good book for people. But I really didn't know this whole story part. Well, that's, that was, that's another whole story. Yeah. But um, what a lovely thing. So when you were wondering why you were going through this, maybe had you not done it, you maybe wouldn't have adopted her. No, this maybe no. gave you said, listen, I have so much to be thankful for. I have to share it with someone. Well, that's Is it. that the way it was? Exactly. I was here. I am with my health bag from from the brink of death, and I'm in a three bedroom townhouse by myself because at that point Marissa was 18, so she moved in with her boyfriend, and she was an adult now and going to go do her thing. And it was very emotional for Marissa going through the treatment and and of everything course, with me. Her wonderful mother. I mean, she wasn't used to seeing me weak and vulnerable. Of course. But here I was, and I said, I have the space. Um, do I have the capacity to love? Yes. Do I have the energy? I hope so. I mean, some days uh, it's a little difficult because now she's 15, so we go through the usual battles. But um, the fact that she's so happy and confident makes me feel like it was all part of God's plan for us. Sounds that way. It sounds just delicious Thank i mean you. i Thank must so say much. that that and and of course you saved your life but i think she saved your life exactly exactly and my friends and family i have to say people stepped up to the plate most people are kind and they they really want to help and that's wonderful i mean some people say the wrong thing and well but they don't know but they don't mean well well let me just tell everybody i'm looking at this beautiful book confessions of a survivor the Cover is so nice, and I haven't asked you about that, but I will. Okay. It's like the clouds in the sky, pink and, and beautiful, and then the water. It's a, it's very pretty, and then uh, Kathleen is, is so nice. She's so open and so pretty and Thank has you. had quite a life, and I think you will really enjoy this, and I'm sure everybody knows someone, whether it doesn't have to be that kind of a cancer, but when you have cancer and you have to go through this, it's uh, pretty unbearable, and you need friends and people, but this is a... Nice little book. It's not a lot of pages. Uh, it's like about 109, 10 pages. And yes. when I first saw it, because we always try to choose books that are pretty important, um, and I, we've been doing this for a lot of years, and I saw this and I said, I think it's time that we do something like this because we know there are so many people out there that will be helped. And it worked out really well. So this is the way you're going to get it. Confessions of a Survivor. Uh, you can go to Amazon. Her name is Kathleen Barbie, B-A-R-B-E-E, and you can order the book. I don't know how much it is, Kathleen. It was fifteen ninety five. Okay. And, and sometimes yeah, on now. Amazon Four, you yeah, can get it lower. But also you can order it at Barnes & Noble locally. Okay. Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, you know, I would say that if you have a friend, tell me if I'm right about this. If you have a friend who's going through cancer now, uh, would this be a good book for them? I just gave the book to somebody last weekend. A friend of mine, her sister, just got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, 54. And a young grandmother, married, lovely lady, Kathy. She's in my prayers. And I thought about it. I reread it. I said, I hope it's not too harsh. But the last two times I saw her, it seemed to me the light was going out of her eyes. 
And I wanted her to know nobody knows. We don't know if it's our last day today. We don't know. I don't know if it's my last exactly. day today and I don't have cancer. Exactly. So, so I want her to know this hope and that uh, this little granddaughter that she's helping raise, Veda. That, oh, um, she has a granddaughter she's helping yes. raise. Okay. And I just thought, you know, I know I, she wants to be there for her graduation and wedding day or whatever. And I'm so I gave her the book and I haven't heard yet because I know she's in the hospital right now and I see you. So I'm hoping it gives her some comfort. And some of it's a little tough to read, I think, some of the parts about being sick and, of course, some of the more personal things I talk about. But I hope with um, there's enough humor in there and enough humanity that that people could get some. Yeah, there was. You know, there Thank were you. the way that you put some of it, you know, it's <laughs> well, like, like you say, busy, busy, very sick day. Yeah, I mean, that was it. That's, that's <laughs> Well, then there's the day I went off on the on the girl that was bagging my groceries and I knew I was really in trouble. You know, I mean the the roller the roller coaster of emotions is definitely in the book. But um my children are great. I know so I'm now the mother of seven and I just had a brand new baby granddaughter born one month ago, Molly Lynn Marino, and I'm so excited to be here for her birth. I can't believe that God spared me to see that 18-year-old is now 25, to see her become a mother. It's a beautiful see, thing. See, now that's, isn't that lovely? Tell me about your doctor. So the doctor that performed the operation, so he's, I is had, he pretty happy? I'll tell you, um, yes, doctor, um, my ear, nose, and throat doctor, Dr. Galen is wonderful. Dr. How do you spell, K-A-G-A-L-E-N? G-A-L-I-N. And I also had Dr. Bushbaum from the Cyber Center. In Wellington, they did my radiation. He was wonderful. And Dr. Feinstein, who's no longer in the area, he's in Georgia, but he was with a medical specialist. Of so, you had, so you had good doctors, and that was really important to you. And nurses that were angels, Great. especially the chemo nurses. Well, we certainly appreciate your coming here and talking about this. I think people will be listening. We'll be putting you on YouTube. And I thank you, and I, will, I know you're going to be fine. I can see it in your eyes, oh, the light you. in your eyes. Thank you, Anita. And thank you for that beautiful book review. Yeah, I really well, was, it was good. I like I I who you are. Okay, so thanks a lot. You're welcome.